Hello to you all, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to today's webinar, The Path Towards 100 Terabits Per Second in One Single Fiber. I'm Jacob from Huawei, and I'm happy to be joined online today by three industry experts in the optical network field. Throughout the event, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the question box on the right-hand side of the screen. We have experts online right now, ready and waiting to answer any questions you might have throughout the event. We'll also have a short Q&A session after our speakers have finished. So joining us today, we have Dr. Liu Kai from China Telecom, Ian Redpath, practice leader of leading research and consultancy firm Omdia, and last but not least, Maxim Kushnorov, Director of the Optical and Quantum Communications Laboratory here at Huawei. Thank you to all three of you for joining me today and everyone else logging in. Let's start by handing over to Ian, who's going to explore the improvement of single fiber capacity in terms of spectrum and rate. Over to you, Ian. Thank you, Jacob. Um... Yes, and thank you for having me. And again, Ian Redpath from Omdia. And I'm going to give a short talk uh, discussing uh, the key trends that are impacting the optical network market, and then also touch on some of the key technology developments that we're seeing. So just to begin, um, you know, it, it, it's all about the uh, digital economy and the transition to the digital economy. We're measuring that at over a trillion dollar uh, business from a revenue perspective. And in the digital economy, I'm including, you know, many, many things, uh, e-commerce, e-advertising revenue that is driven off of search and social platforms, cloud services, and, and much, much more. And the reason that that is so important is it's driving two very significant industry roadmaps. It's driving what we call a, uh, a data center construction roadmap. So a massive core of cloud data centers. And now we're hearing more and more about uh, edge compute and, and the growth of edge data centers as well. So we have that roadmap of data center construction, and that's paired with a massive uh, bandwidth roadmap that's that's connecting all that. And so it's, it's bandwidth that's coming in. I like to call it fan-in bandwidth coming from the consumer and the enterprise side. And then we have a massive data center interconnect terabit core that is also part of the equation. And so we've got, you know, a uh, huge uh, growth in, in high capacity uh, services. So, um, you know, just continuing, you know, we've all endured uh, the pandemic and, you know, just a, a quick word there. Um, it's, it's really, you know, sharpened the messages around the value of cloud services. Um, you know, we, we all saw that. So the unprecedented uh, ramp up of collaboration uh, services, you know, many folks working and schooling from home. All of that was based on a cloud platform that was resident in the data centers that, that I just mentioned. And, you know, another thing that the pandemic did is it really, uh, you know, heightened the focus around site uh, diversity and, and the value of diversity and supporting that distributed workforce. So again, you know, feeding uh, the whole cloud machine and the bandwidth infrastructure that's supporting that. Um, and so, you know, in terms of uh, the bandwidth element of it, you know, we've got growth in, in many facets of, uh, of, of bandwidth, uh, as I mentioned. So we're, we're really seeing a number of these, uh, you know, coming to the fore and growing in importance. So there's some different, you know, variations of bandwidth that are at play. Um, you know, OTN uh, private line services have been uh, rising in the market. You know, we do have more and more high capacity services. We have other services, and you know, here I'm speaking, you know, in the, in the wholesale, very high capacity context. But we have growth in wave services, and as I also mentioned, terabit DCI. So all of those are are growing, and you know, in addition to that. Uh, there are a couple of key requirements in there. Um, latency is, uh, you know, it, it's always been very, very important in networks, but it's increasing in importance and coming to the fore. So, 
all of this from the fan inside through to the core side, you know, must be delivered in a low latency context. Uh, you know, nimble connectivity as well, being able to, uh, you know, shift around uh, to address uh, bursty, bursty needs and whatnot. Uh, and and the largest customers, you know, want to peer into those networks and take advantage of the telemetry data that has been generated, and they do want more uh, advanced control. So it, it, that's another um, key trend. So, you know, we, we've seen many, many uh, graphics on, on the traffic is growing and, you know, the growth of traffic. This is my take on, on traffic is growing. And it's, it's a little bit of a different take, you know, coming from uh, the optical side. I'm measuring, uh, you know, a key metric in the, uh, in the optical realm. So if you take a look, a quick look at my uh, graphic there, what I have is both uh, history and a little bit of a forecast of coherent optical ports. So this is, you know, the highest uh, bandwidth port that is available in the industry. What I'm measuring here is 100 gig up to 800 gig uh, coherent optical ports. And you can see uh, from the graph that you know we it, there, it it's it's starting to achieve very very significant volumes. If you think about it from a consumer perspective, you know a number such as ten million is is not very much from a consumer perspective. But when you're considering uh, optical ports, you know reaching ten million optical ports uh, that you know are again a hundred gig uh, plus, it it represents a huge amount of bandwidth. So it, this is representing. Uh, petabits of, of bandwidth. And, you know, I, the, the 10 million mark, I think, is a real uh, achievement for the industry. It's it's a real watershed moment, a very significant amount of bandwidth, to be sure. Um, and so this is being shipped by the vendor community, and it's being deployed by, you know, major uh, communication service providers, but then other folks as well, uh, cloud providers, enterprise, government, it, you know, all of those folks taken together are getting us to the uh, the 10 million uh, port mark. And this uh, vast optical capability really is the underpinning of, of the uh, digital economy that I've uh, just been speaking about. Um, so now, you know, shifting the discussion a little bit more to the technology side. So what are uh, all the tools and all the levers that can get us to that other key mark of 100 terabit for per fiber pair. So the industry does have, um, you know, another, a, a number of tricks, uh, in, you know, tools in the toolbox that are taking us towards the, uh, the 100 uh, terabit mark. Um, so on one side, um, you know, there's uh, increasing um, the baud rate. So uh, in, in increasing the baud rate has been a foundational uh, technology it allows us to achieve both higher capacities and, and longer reach. A, a parallel uh, side benefit there is as we've gone to higher and higher baud rates and using you know, more advanced CMOS technologies, we, the industry has been able to lower the, uh, the power necessary to, uh, to drive these networks as well. Um, so yeah, the industry is going to absolutely keep on 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 that path of advancing uh, baud rates, um, and you know it, it, it requires uh, a number of base advances in a number of base technologies as well. Um, you know, not only the uh, DSPs and the electro optics, but also modulators, photodiodes, uh, TIAs, and uh, a, a, uh, the uh, ADCs and, and, and DACs as well. So yeah, the industry is absolutely continuing uh, down that uh, track, but you know, that alone is, is not quite enough. Um, you know, we're getting to some impressive capacities within the C-band, but if we look at, uh, you know, other uh, techniques and technologies uh, beyond the C-band, that can take us, you know, a bit further in advancing uh, the uh, the high band rate, higher bandwidth rates per per fiber pair. Um, so here's a picture of uh, the band. So I've got uh, a number of the bands here. I've got uh, the traditional C, uh, extended C, super C, and and also uh, the L band. So you know if we if we kind of start quickly from just 
sort of the uh, historical context and where we were. Uh, the traditional C-band was 80 wavelengths and that consumed 50 gigahertz of, of spectrum. Um, so, you know, we've, we've been in that environment for years and years, if not decades. And then the next step in the evolution was taking that to the extended C band, which, which uh, took us up to 96 wavelengths um, in, in that slightly larger uh, C band configuration. And now we've moved on to the super C solutions uh, up to 120 wavelengths. So a 50% improvement over the traditional um, C band uh, alone. And you know a key in all that is having the whole components ecosystem to build up to support uh, Super C, and, and it has. So now we have Super C lasers, Super C WSSs, Super C amplifiers. All of that is necessary to cost-effectively support a Super C environment. And then in parallel, you know the industry is also working on L band and. Uh, you know, also the ecosystem needs to build up there as well. And, you know, what the industry is offering, uh, you know, quite a bit at the moment is the option to deploy a, a C, Super C system with the option to upgrade to an L band when the requirements necessitate. So, you know, carriers don't need to, uh, you know, endure the full cost of L band day one. They can look to, you know, upgrade at, at a slater, slightly later date, um, you know, when their when their bandwidth grows and they truly have the need. So it's a nice, you know, effectively pay as you grow option, if you will. Um, so then, you know, where are we in terms of uh, technology uh, readiness and uh, maturity here? So when I look at this part of the market, um, you, you know, oftentimes when you uh, add a, a, a new technology you're, you're you're in that very classic kind of chicken and the egg situation where you know the industry does want it but the volumes are low so the costs are a little bit high you've kind of got to get over that uh hurdle you know where you get uh the volumes up and then the ecosystem can really start to ramp and volumes can grow and we can start to uh bring uh, uh you know cost down and get to a more economic uh, solution so we we saw a bit of that in this part of the market as well so some of the early cases for deployment um you know carriers and and some cloud providers were had situations in their network where they only had a single fiber pair and when they had a single fiber pair they were you know it, it made sense to uh deploy you know a more advanced technology solution because adding a second fiber pair to a certain part of the network was very, very expensive. But the key thing there was that really started the market. And then we rapidly moved uh, down the maturity curve uh, for Super C. And so, you know, what I found was impressive was it went from that kind of niche uh, condition to a real volume and a, a commercial and a mature uh, position uh, quite quickly. And, you know, the way that we've uh, seen that develop is, you know, now carriers are considering this not for just niche situations, but widespread network deployment. And then another kind of measure of maturity is, you know, it, it, it's gone from, you know, cloud providers only to many, many types of organizations are, are looking to uh, deploy and have deployed super C solutions. So, you know, the cloud um, communication service providers, you know, some enterprises that have deployed their own fiber networks, other kinds of organizations, utilities and governments. This has become uh, a much more uh, widespread mainstream and accepted uh, type of technology and is, is advancing uh, quite well. So, you know, in terms of, um, you know, choosing between an ultra wideband super C versus a multiband C plus L, it's, it's always dependent on uh, the economics and as this whole market continues to grow uh, the economics will become more and more attractive as the volumes scale uh, just a, a, a quick uh, chart on um, you know we, we did a survey here at Omdia and uh, you can see from my uh, graphic uh some of the responses that we got to the survey so the, the question was how important are the following technologies uh in terms of improving the economic value of optical networks and you can see there's a number of items uh down uh 
below, you know, that pertain to uh, WSSs and, and things such as OXC. Um, but the point that I want you, uh, hoping the audience will focus in on is the, uh, the response of integrated Super C WSSs and more integrated cost-effective Super C systems. So this is, you know, the carrier community playing back to us that this technology is uh, very important and, and critical to them and one of the uh, top uh, uh, ways that they're looking for the technology to take the optical network uh, forward and uh, advance. So just getting to uh, my concluding slide, um, you know, absolutely the digital economy is uh, continuing to uh, grow uh, impressively. Cloud adoption continues to grow and accelerate. And then transmission technologies are, are keeping pace and advancing and um, Super C is absolutely a mainstream option for uh, folks to consider now. Um, so, uh, thank you. And, and Jacob, I believe we have a uh, a poll question uh, teed up. That we do. Thank you very much, Ian. So, as Ian just pointed out, if you look to the right of the screen, we have a poll running today. Um, you should be able to see the question there on the right side of the screen. Which solution produces a lower TCO for your network? We'll give you a few moments to choose your answer. Okay, interestingly enough, it seems the majority of you, or 64%, went with option B, one times super C plus L system. So, Ian, what's your take on that? And is that what you expected? <laughs> yeah, you know, everyone's situation is uh, unique and, uh, you know, it, it, it's always a, a complicated uh, equation for many, many folks. And, you know, we have focused in on the uh, amplification discussion and the application aspect of this, but it's really, you know, the entire uh, network that comes into play. And, you know, there could be things such as uh, fiber types and fiber availability. Um, so there, there's many, many factors that play into the economics for folks. So, yeah, it, it really uh, is up to the uh, each individual uh, carrier what is the right solution uh, for them. So, yeah, not entirely uh, uh, surprising. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Ian. Now, let's move on and hear from Dr. Liu who's going to outline the advances made in research on extended C-band wavelength division multiplexing system technology. Dr. Liu, please begin when you're ready. Okay, thank you, the host. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Liu Kai from China Telecom Research Institute. It's my pleasure to share advances in research on extended C-band WDM system technology in China Telecom. Technical schemes for extending band include four kinds. First, C80 supports 80 wavelength with uh, 50 gigahertz channel spacing and 4 terahertz spectrum width. This scheme has been standardized. Second, C8, uh, C96 on the basis of 80 wavelength, extend certain wavelength to the short wavelength and the long wavelength, respectively. The wavelength transmission performance of C96 is similar to that of traditional C80, but the transmission capacity can be increased by 20%. Currently, carriers in China have started to deploy, uh, deploy the C96 scheme. Third, extended C-band. The target is to expand the number of wavelength from 80 to 120 and expand the spectrum range from 4 terahertz to 6 terahertz. 
Currently, the C one hundred and twenty research report project of CCSA has been concluded at the eighteenth meeting of TC six WG one. The C one hundred and twenty industry standards project has been、uh, initiated at the CCSA plenary meeting. In November 2020, the industry standard drafting is expected in the second half of 2021. Fourth, C plus L band. The L band is introduced to transmission to support a total of 192 wavelength, which. Uh, can double the transmission capacity and increase the spectrum bandwidth to nine point six terahertz. The standard C band needs to be implemented、uh, based on the spectrum range of the current C eighty or C ninety six system. Uh. An appropriate spectrum range should be selected to ensure the optimal system performance within the entire wavelength range. For example, in consideration of the performance of、uh, optical amplifiers, the spectrum range of the extended C band may be selected as one thousand. Five hundred and twenty-four to one thousand five hundred and seventy-two nanometer. The wavelength range and channel allocation vary depending on technical、uh, technical details. It is recommended that、uh, the industry. Accelerate related standards research. In general, the extended C-band DWDM system is similar to the current C80 or C96 system. Therefore, the mature experience of the current C80 or C96 system. Can be used as a reference for system design, development, verification, and application on the live network to effectively reduce development costs. After the bands are expanded, ah,、uh, after the the bands are extended, nonlinear effects sh-、uh, such as Scattering may occur when nonlinear effects occur. Measures such as SRS effect compensation, OA configuration optimization, and dynamic power control can be used for improvement. After expansion, key comp、uh, key components such as coherent optical modules. Multiple lectures or the multiple lectures, optical amplifiers, optical filters, as well as、uh, optical supervisory channels, need to be customized or further optimized based on the technology maturity of key component. The mature C band industry chain. Can be used for the extended C-band DWDM system, facilitating the rapid commercial use of the extended C-band DWDM system. However, key components need to be optimized, and the localization capacity is already available. NGOF also hopes that. The industry chain can maintain an open and win-win situation to jointly promote industry development.
according to the NGF work plan and the digestion of the extended seabed data system has been started in 2020 and the pattern application has been promoted. The extended C-band DWDM system will be put into commercial deployment in 2021. Many in backbone long haul transmission scenarios. After the cost decreases in the future, the system can be used in me uh, metro scenarios. The C band 4 terahertz spectrum width meets 100G 80 wavelength transmission requirements. And the extended C band 6 terahertz spectrum width meets 200G 80 wavelength transmission requirements. In the future, when a, sing uh, when a single wavelength rate is uh, development uh, is developed to 400 G or higher. The C plus L spectrum or wider spectrum width is required to meet the uh, objective of doubling the capacity without changing the distance. Looking to the future, China Telecom will continue to research uh, large capacity DWDM systems and work with the entire industry to continuously improve network capabilities and build more powerful all optical networks. That's all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Li. Now I'd like to invite Maxim who's going to explore the key technologies involved in reaching 100 terabit per second speeds over a single fiber, namely Super C and Super C plus L. Let's hand over to Maxim. Thanks, Jacob. A pleasure to be here. Good day to you all. So let's talk about in a bit more detail what it actually means to deploy a C plus L band system. Uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, C and L band line system components are separate. So we have dedicated L band amplifiers, dedicated uh, C band amplifiers. Same goes for the rodents. This is the baseline we're starting at. So today, C plus L band is not one merged um, system, but the complexity of kind of running these two line systems in parallel needs to be managed. And there are a few challenges with this. On one hand, there's a basic performance channel. So uh, the challenge is also the reason why we uh, as an industry started to uh, populate the C-band first. And namely that the efficiency of uh, urban dump fibers is, is better in C-band, right? So we can get more um, gain with lower noise figures compared to the L-band. Um, so what it means is going to L-band was usually associated with a you know, lower performance um, also because of the uh, uh, higher noise figures of the Albert amplifiers. But ideally, it should not be like this. Ideally, should you know, uh, deploying C plus Albert should be a bit more seamless. And the other issue is, and these kind of uh, problems only occur if you pretty much run C plus Albert, uh, is a more pronounced impact of stimulated drama scattering, SRS. These are effects which... Um, this effect pumps power from um, um, smaller, shorter wavelengths to higher wavelengths. And it's also the same effect, which uh, is used for Raman amplifiers. Yeah? So this effect can be good, can also be a bit detrimental, depending on how um, and what exactly it is used for. And we will see that uh, if, for example, we have a temporary catastrophic failure, like a uh, Sieben amplifier going down, that the effect of this SRS effect can have a, uh, an impact on the performance in the L band. And this impact can be quite, uh, quite negative, quite detrimental. 
And also what uh, Ian mentioned, um, deploying C plus L um, is also a matter of, you know, well, TCO. Uh, so you, you uh, often operators do not know when exactly will they reach a point at which the C band is full and one needs to go to the L band the next step and having to deploy everything day one is not a good option. So it's um, what we need here as industries to have a kind of smooth upgrade path towards L band once you know we reach uh, the capacity limits on a C band transmission. So in the following slides, I will address these challenges and, and show what um, we did at Huawei and uh, how these problems can be solved. So number one is the uh, a new super L band amplifier. As already mentioned uh, prior, so not only does the kind of the classical uh, EDFA have much lower gain at these L band wavelengths, also the uh, classical L band amplifier was um, you know, limited similarly to the classical C band, the standard C band, right? So it was going up to maybe 1609 or 1611 nanometers. Um, and the question is, okay, we are here trying to expand the capacity per fiber. Now you may know that Huawei already um, um, invested in super C band. So naturally here, also the goal was to extend the uh, spectrum, the usable spectrum of the L band and improve the performance of it. So this is what we did. We uh, developed a novel wideband e urban dub fiber EDF, which as you see on the right, has um, a wider amplification spectrum going up to approximately 16, 18 nanometers and uh, would reduce noise figure. So the, uh, the gap between the state of the art uh, C band amplifiers and these new L band amplifiers is manageable. You know, it's not a you know, huge step down anymore where you um, will be, become more complicated uh, to manage this network. But with kind of very close performances of CBIN. Um, so let's go forward. We, uh, the impact of SRS. And this is uh, actually quite an interesting effect, which can be both good and bad. On one hand, you know, we use it for almond amplification. But on the other hand, if you look at the left side, we see that this effect kind of has its maximum at an 11 terahertz distance, so roughly 90 nanometers. Meaning that if we actually deploy a uh, super C plus L band system, which also roughly covers 11 terahertz, that the uh, pumping effect from uh, C band channels become quite pronounced on the L band, right? So there's a, a, a lot of pumping going on from C towards the L band. And on one hand, okay, it's nice, you know, you get kind of amplification for free. But on the other hand, as I already mentioned, what happens in the case of a catastrophic failure? You know, the C band amplifier goes down or there's a, a rerouting or is a, I don't know, you know, fiber failure of, of a, a C-band patch cord, these things can happen. I mean, they're not uh, excluded. And in this case, if we imagine losing the whole C-band, the uh, power drop that we then experience on the L-band is substantial. So in case of a say, scenario of nine spans, we would see up to 10 dB power drop. And it's, I think it's, uh, it's clear that once we, uh, the signal power drops that much, traffic is lost and it's lost for quite a time until the system recalibrates itself. So this is a new problem. It hasn't happened before when we um, had, you know, purely C-band amplification with a, just a single C-band amplifier. So how do we handle this problem? Uh, well, Huawei's solution is to implement, as shown on, um, uh, on the left and the right, a combination between uh, dummy light loading where we uh, um, load, uh, kind of the system is uh, fully loaded, uh, either with traffic signals or just with lasers, which uh, create kind of the you know, more stable environment uh, where C and L band can coexist. But we'll see, we'll see later that just having these dummy lights or kind of uh, configurable dummy lights does not fully address the issue. It's, uh, it still would lead, if we only relied on this technology, to an outage which would last several seconds, depending on how fast the WSS can switch, the rotom can switch. And even then, the compensation would not be ideal. So it needs to be combined with a very fast um, monitoring and tracking device. It's the SRS compensator, which really measures the uh, spectra in L and C bands 
and it can in very fast manner adapt the amplifier gains in the system to adjust for this outage. So let's see a few examples of how this can work. This is a uh, uh, scenario number one. So we have you know, site number one, rotor number one, and rotor number two. Now let's imagine, uh, so we already said before, C and L band amplifiers are dedicated components. If we have a failure of the C band amplifier here, um, we see that the, on the left side, the whole C band spectrum just goes down and disappears, right? And then, as mentioned, the power drop on the L band, which is combined dummy light and uh, traffic light, is quite significant. It's uh, you know, in the range of, again, for this example of nine spans of 10 dB, the, the longer the, the, you know, the distance between these two rotoms, the more the drop. And there's pretty much nothing one can do. You know, the, um, there's no dummy light that can be loaded. There's no intermediate rotom in the link. So if we uh, were to design a compensation, it would be first fast, and second would need to bring up the, as on the right side, you see the power of uh, the album channels to a level where we can, already, we can have traffic again. And we can uh, have the system can kind of stabilize, calibrate, but we would not have an outage which could last several seconds or potentially just be, uh, uh, in a sense, damaging because you know, usually 10 dB of power drop one cannot just easily uh, recalibrate. Second ex uh, example. This is a you know, more complex link. We have um, three rotom sites, three adopt sites. And in this case, again, let's imagine the same amplifier fails. This is C on the left up. You know, the C band amplifier goes down. Now what happens now is if you don't have any uh, fast kind of SRS uh, transient compensation, but you still use the idea of dummy light, um, if you see on the left side, we deploy dummy light loading, we can only use it from site two to site three. We cannot account for whatever happened before. So this means that also on site two, we added channels L51 to L100. And these channels, uh, as you see, they recovered quite, uh, quite okay because they see dummy light propagation the whole way through, although it is still a bit uh, unbalanced. But the channels which went the whole way from site one to site three, they only see a partial impact from these dummy channels. And they are uh, well uh, underbalanced and you know, under amplified. So this is not a stable functioning link. So what we need on the right side, as we see, we need to uh, have a very fast transient control where uh, if this event happens, the, the, the album fire gains are tuned very fastly to according levels. And then dummy light loading and stabilization of the system. So overall, um, you know, we will not see on higher levels any outage in system performance on the outband channels. This is a desired state, and this is what Huawei implemented in our product. Now, um, problem number three, which we mentioned, is the upgrade scenario. The upgrade needs to be really seamless and uh, pay as we grow. So. Uh, on the left side, you see that, um, I mean, despite the fact that we narrowed down, um, you know, the gap between C and L band amplifier performance, there's still slightly different also fiber losses. And then overall, uh, the combined system requires some more additional margin. So now we account for this uh, additional margin, and then we can operate the whole system, C plus L band, as like one um, uh, holistic network. Yeah? But the margin in itself is not substantially big. And the second part on the right side, we see that the, uh, our amplifier cards are built as host cards with pay as you grow uh, pluggable amplifiers. So uh, day one, we introduced the C-band uh, amplifiers and rotoms. And when needed, you see here in the slots, we can add the L-band amplification. And also uh, there's a slot for the SRS compensation module, which um, can be added uh, when the LBAN starts deploying. So there's no need to deploy LBAN day one. It's obvious that LBAN uh, components due to the lower volume in the market are more expensive. So it's only wise to postpone that um, uh, deployment to a later stage when LBAN is actually needed. 
So uh, to summarize, you know, we have two options of extending C plus algorithm systems. Um, and option number one is we uh, uh, do, do a pace to grow approach. So we start with a kind of baseline system, which uh, uh, is based fully on C-band uh, components and only include the necessary couplers, uh, which uh, are used on the left side, these green parts that you see there, which are uh, you know, the cars that we would connect to uh, when we have the Alban system ready. That's like the only installation which needs to be done to account for a future expansion, but there's nothing else. And once uh, we go through the network upgrade, you know, we can uh, include urban amplifiers and rotoms to start in the first stage, you know, we we'll load the system with dummy light. And, it's, and in the last stage, of course, we we'll populate the L-band with the actual traffic. So I think the operator has a choice. We can decide when exactly to roll out the L-band. It can also be that due to, uh, it may be beneficial to roll it out day one, then one would not have to visit those sites again uh, later on when the um, uh, demand rises up to have Alband um, application running. So it's really up to the uh, the operator and the kind of the, the seamless pluggability of um, the C and Alband amplifiers makes it really easy to have pace to grow in this case. Now, um, I think we spoke a lot about the fact that today C and Alband line systems are, well, they're not a joint merge system. It's, it's, it's one system, but component-wise, the separate components, right? We have dedicated C and Alband amplifiers, we have dedicated rotoms, WSSs. And of course, you know, the more components you have, I think it's the simple knowledge, the more expensive uh, a system becomes, the more space it needs. So our road, uh, roadmap going forward uh, uh, foresees to have a joint C plus Alband wavelength selective switch, WSS, which you know is the core component of any rotem. And this would um, make it even easier to, to really uh, have to, to configure the system, to operate the system. It will re really have the touch and feel of a simple uh, C band line system. And the slot of occupation would be reduced if we have an integrated WSS. And also the cost, you know, cost-wise, um, a two days C plus L band. I mean, we see we double up the components, right? And I also mentioned that the L band is typically a bit more expensive than the C band due to the, just the lower volume in the market. So having said that, uh, an integrated rotem would definitely reduce the overall costs of uh, the line system and make it, you know, way more cost effective going forward. And this is kind of the right approach to really evolve the line system going forward. Now, um, kind of coming back to, to say the basics and you now kind of the baseline today is, is not the extended C band anymore, it's the super C band. So two days networks ideally should be rolled out based on super C band amplification. And today we already have uh, 20 plus customers in the whole world, which deploy super C band networks. We have uh, more than 40,000 kilometers of uh, link length around the world, which uh, with more than 9,000 9, amplifiers. So it's a mature technology. It's been rolled out worldwide. You know, we see on the major operators, which use uh, super C band. And super C band is then the baseline stepping stone towards the network expansion of having the L band. Now I think it uh, should be almost my last slide. Uh, we spoke a lot about the, uh, the line system, and how to expand the available spectrum. But of course, at the same time, we need to have efficient modems and uh, transceivers to really utilize a spectrum. And the latest generation of uh, Huawei's modems uses uh, advanced signal processing, which in, um, is comprised of several um, dedicated subcomponents, for example, ultra fast tracking of uh, uh, polarization. This is a regular case for um, ground wire cable deployment 
we have advanced uh, crystallization shaping. We have a technique called Festel and Nyquist, which is used to really compress the spectrum and enable a uh, spacing for 800 gig in a 100 gigahertz um, um, grid. And all of this is supported by additional uh, know-how from kind of AI layers where we have, uh, you know, we start to introduce the first baseline of the of uh, deep neural networks into our um, transceivers and use AI learning to really adapt better to the actual environment because in the end every link is different and one can optimize the performance by really better analyzing what's inside. And on the right you see that um, our latest modem, we just listed here the baseline features of 800 gig, 600 gig, 400 gig. Um, it's kind of an important table. This is how well it would perform under various different conditions. So uh, in a system where we have kind of a fully loaded um, fully loaded 800 gig where they you know up to um, um, 110 channels in super C plus L band and uh, an overall capacity of 88 terabits. This would be uh, addressed in 80 kilometer hyperscale DCI interconnect scenario. Of course, uh, the same 800 gig, you know, if we just run a proof of concept on very good fiber, you know, an equally spaced um, uh, spans, we see that. This 800 gig can reach more than 1,000 kilometers easily. And then, of course, we have a, also one important mode is the 400 gig mode, which uh, on, say, a baseline network with EDFA amplification reaches more than 1,200 kilometers. And, you know, if we include Raman, uh, we can pretty much address, uh, you know, all the varieties of uh, long-haul backbone. So I think, uh, with well, this one true, but actually I, I forgot to ask Jacob to, uh, to play a video which would show us the SRS compensation. So maybe now is a good time to kind of come back to our uh, source compensation and show a little demo. Jacob? Sure, sure, I'm on it. Dear customer, this is Huawei testing, and here is a topology of C plus L. Here we can see we have two sides, and they are M24 series, and each sides are equipped with one WDAP XF board. Besides, we use two spectrum analyzers here, and OSA1 is connected on the transmit port on WDAP-XF board, and another OSA is connected on the receive port of WDAP-XF board. And here is the test environment of our lab. We can see we have two OSA. The OSA1 is connected on this M24 series, and the OSA2 is connected on the receive port of this M24 series. And here is the interface of OSA2. We can see we have two parts. On the left part is Super C band, and on the right part is L band. Then we are going to do two procedures. Firstly, my colleague will going to plug out the amplifier of C band without SRS compensator. Then, let's go to step two. My, plug, my, uh, my colleague will going to plug out the amplifier of C-band with SRS compensator. So, let's go to step one. Please, my colleague will going to plug out the fiber of the amplifier on C, of C-band. C And here is the interface. We can see the signal on Super C band disappear, and the performance of the signal on L band decreased severely. Then my my colleague will going to recover the environment. Please, my colleague, recover the environment. Then let's go to step two. Let's use SRS compensator and plug out the fiber on the amplifier of C-band again. Please, my co colleague, plug out the fiber. We can see the signal on the super C-band disappear again. 
However, the signal on the air band uh, disappeared slightly, decreased slightly. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Now it's time for another question. Um, so if you see under the polls tab on the right hand side of the screen, we have the second question for us. Are you willing to deploy L band if it deteriorates system performance? A, no. B, yes, but only at a certain degradation level, for example, less than two dB. Or C, no opinion, it doesn't affect me. Again, I'll give you guys a few moments to choose your answer. So this time, it seems like the majority of people opted for option B. Yes, but only at a certain degradation level. Uh, what do you make of that, Maxim? Well, you know, I think it's good because you know it shows that uh, I think we understand what the element means, right? We we know it's not cannot be the same uh, as having CBAN system running. There needs to be a certain trade-off, but this trade-off better be small. And I mentioned before that uh, we um, you know foresee like a 1.5 dB margin to for a super C plus element system, which is you know below this uh, mentioned 2 dB. So. Um, yeah, I think on a system level, if you think about it, to say one dB, for example, is not that much. You know, it's it's uh, it's certainly uh, less to pay for one dB than to pay for an additional line system or additional fiber. So I think yeah, that, that's that's a reasonable answer. I think. Great, thanks, Maxim. Okay, we're now approaching the end of the presentation. Maxim, could I please ask you to quickly run us through a quick summary of what has been discussed today already? Thanks, Jacob. So uh, to, to conclude, you know, we uh, identified that we need in order to improve the L band to really improve the components for the L band, and uh, not just on a pure subcomponent level, like we have, you know, a wider band L band amplifier, but also on a system level where we implement uh, this SRS compensation for the cases of um, uh, C band amplifier failures, and uh, if we combine. This compensation with a, with a very fast transient tracking with a dummy light, we can actually ensure that C plus helmet can operate uh, safely. And in the case of a C band failure, the element doesn't have a traffic hit. We uh, discussed that compared to a pure C band system, we do need to assign additional margin to C plus L band on um, 1.5 dB margin. And uh, was one important aspect that the deployment of C plus L band can be pay as you grow. It does need to happen day one. And pluggable amplifiers here, I think, is one important differentiator that makes it really easy for operators to uh, just plug in a hot pluggable card without you know, really having additional line cards to be brought, brought up. It's a seamless and easy way to uh, roll out the element in an existing live network. We also, of course, uh, concluded that it's not just a spectrum, but also how we use it. And in this case, um, Beyond 400 gig capacity per, per wavelength is needed. We have seen uh, s uh, indications results on Huawei's 800 gig solution. And also, uh, you know, I think in order to really um, go towards the 100 terabits, you know, we need to continue improving all these aspects. So, with this, I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now it's time for the audience to ask some questions. If you haven't already done so, please use the chat function on the right-hand side of the screen to send us your questions. And the first question I have here is relating, relating to China Telecom. So I'll direct this question at Dr. Liu. Dr. Liu, does China Telecom conduct research into the application of CNL in B100G? Okay, uh, yes. Relevant uh, research has been conducted. However, considering the maturity and the cost of the industry chain, research on SRIs, flatness, and performance impact has been conducted in the lab. Relevant standards 
will be developed in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And the second question I have here, I will direct back at Maxim. Does the CNL system have specific fiber type requirements? Uh, well, um, I think for, for most fibers, most fibers Super C plus Albion can be used and uh, it should not be an issue. I think the only problem would be with, you know, these uh, fibers which already today are not, you know, the best ones to be used, like these DSF stretch shifted fibers, you know, G653, so uh, which have, you know, very low uh, dispersion coefficient in C bands to begin with, and actually optimally suited anyway for coherent transmission. So if we leave those out, I think for everything else, like uh, G652 or 54, 55, um, super C7 can be used without problems. Great. And I guess this question relates to the ent entire um, entire subject today. Uh, so basically to wrap up, Maxim, how can we achieve 100 terabit per second speeds in a single fiber? Yeah, I think this was kind of the name of the workshop, right? We haven't actually explicitly put this information down right. on the path out towards it. Um, so uh, today's baseline, I think I already mentioned is we can have uh, we're using 8 and gig and super C plus L band, we can have 88 terabits per second for these high capacity DCI applications. So how do we go beyond, you know, from 88 to beyond 100 uh, terabits? Um, I mean, in general, the spectral efficiency and performance cannot be improved like that much anymore. Meaning that, you know, we, I don't think we can uh, go to similar distances to 100 terabits easily just by looking at the modems. We will need to further continue increasing the uh, amplified spectrum. I think if we're combining these two, some further advances on the modem side, which are becoming, you know, harder and harder with each generation and more incremental and continuous uh, innovation on expanding the spectrum uh, further, you know, also in the L-band, we will be able to crack the 100 terabit mark and go beyond. Great, thank you. Unfortunately, we're a bit tight on time, so let's wrap up the Q&A there. Thank you for all of your questions, and I'm sorry if we didn't get around to answering yours live. We'll get back to you over email, rest assured. I'd like to end by thanking all of our guests, Ian, Dr. Liu, and Maxim. Thank you for your valuable time and insight. And of course, thanks to all of you out there watching. Take care and goodbye. <laughs>